Good day everyone! In today's video, we will be learning about mineral resources. The topics includes the minerals in our daily life, mineral deposits, the mineral resources, how we will explore the minerals, and lastly, the environmental impacts of exploring the minerals. To start with, let's talk about the minerals we are using in our everyday life. First, antimony. Antimony can be used in creating batteries like the battery of our calculator, the battery of our phone, our laptop battery, and lastly, the dry cells that we are using. Another element that we usually encounter in our daily life is barium. Barium can be used in x-ray processes. It can also be used in creating a sturdy rubber, in creating sturdy glasses as well, and also, barium can be used to kill rats. We also have here the cobalt mineral. This mineral is a very intense coloring agent just like in creating glasses. And because cobalt also is a super alloy that has a high stability to temperatures, they are also used in creating jet engines. Another is copper. This is common in our place because we call it as gambang. This is uh, usually used in, in making currencies and at the same time in creating jewelries. We also have calcium carbide, also known as calboro in our term. And I know you are familiar with this because these are used in uh, hastening the process in fruit ripening. So these are just some of the common minerals we encounter in our daily life. Also, we might not be aware, however, we are also, or minerals also, are used in creating the cell phone that we are using, the keys, the coin, our money, the pencil or the pen we are using, and even ladies for the makeup that you are using, even the powder, or the glasses that we are using. So, mineral is very important in our daily life. Moving on, here are some terminologies that we must familiarize when talking about mineral deposits. First is mineral occurrence. This talks about the concentration of a mineral that is of scientific or technical interest. Or in layman's term, this refers to any locality where a useful mineral is found. Another is mineral deposit. This refers to the mineral occurrence of sufficient size and grade or concentration to enable extraction under most favorable condition, or meaning it talks about the mineral that we can mine. Another, we have ore deposits. This one talks about the mineral deposits that has been tested and known to be economically profitable to mine, such as gold and silver. Aggregate also refers to rocks or minerals that are described as non-metallic and they are usually used as fillers in cement, asphalt, and plaster. Lastly, we have ore. When we say ore, these are the naturally occurring material from which a mineral or minerals of economic value can be extracted, such as the aluminum ore, iron ore, and zinc ore. Talking about uh, mineral resources, we can generally categorize them into two whether they are metallic and non-metallic. Metallic minerals talks about, of course, the minerals that are made up of metals just like gold, silver, copper, platinum, and iron. And also for non-metallic resources, they are non-metals just like talc powder, sulfur, sand, and so on and so forth. 
Moving on, we will talk about the origins of the mineral resources we have. And we must take note that mineral resources can be classified according to the mechanisms responsible for concentrating the valuable substances. And this usually affects the composition and structure of the different minerals we have. Just like if you will notice in the picture, they have different colors, different structure, and they have different composition as well. First, let's talk about the minerals that are formed from magmatic ore deposits. And these are the valuable substances that are concentrated within an igneous body through magmatic processes. And what are those processes? It includes crystal fractionation, partial melting, and crystal settling. Let's talk about them one by one. First, let's talk about crystal settling. In this process, Minerals tend to crystallize and settle at the lower portion of magma chamber as magma cools down inside Earth. This includes chromite, the first picture on the right, magnetite as well, the second picture, and platinum, the last picture. While when we talk about fractional crystallization, it talks about the high percentages of water in volatile substances that are favorable for the formation of pegmatites. So this means that it has a fraction or a part of water and then also a part of volatile substances. When they join together, they tend to create crystals or minerals. So one best example is uh, pegmatite. And this mineral looks like this as you can see on the picture provided. Another origin of mineral resources includes hydrothermal ore deposits. These are formed because of the concentration of valuable substances by hot aqueous fluids flowing through fractures and spaces in rocks. And because of this, they follow the specific size and shape of the fracture and spaces in rocks. This one includes three types or three examples and let's talk about them one by one. I'll their hydrothermal ore deposit the common type that we usually see is under vein type hydrothermal ore so it has the characteristics of the following they are inclined and discordant and typically narrow yes also they occur in fold or features opening or in shear zones within the country rock and usually the examples are the common hydrothermal vein deposits are the following we have gold silver copper lead zinc and mercury here are some examples of a vein type hydrothermal ore deposit so notice that they are narrow just like that Another example under hydrothermal ore deposit is the disseminated deposits. Well, in this case, ore minerals are distributed as minute masses, or meaning they are in a very low concentration through large volumes of rock. One best example here is uh, the porphyry copper deposit. And if you will notice the picture here, if I can only give you the big picture of it, then this rock, the block one here surrounding this, has a very big structure or very big size. However, we can only find a small porphyry copper deposit that you can see in the picture. The last example under hydrothermal ore deposits is about the massive sulfide deposit. Well, these are formed when hot fluids that circulated above magma chambers at oceanic ridges that may contain sulfur, copper, and zinc come in contact with cold groundwater or seawater as it migrates towards the seafloor. So, meaning to say, massive sulfide deposits are formed because of the combination of hot fluids that contain different minerals and it will be combined with the, uh, cold water.
Some examples are the following. We have spalla, right? If you notice this one, it has a combination of zinc and sulfur. When they combine together, they tend to crystallize and create or form a sphalerite. Also, the second example, we have chalcopyrite. It's a combination of three elements, just like copper, iron, and sulfur. So when they combine together and then uh, because of the combination of hot and cold water along the uh, sea water or groundwater towards the seafloor, they tend to create these examples of uh, minerals. Sedimentary ore deposit is the third origin of uh, mineral resources. And uh, talking about sedimentary ore deposits, these are concentrated by uh, chemical precipitation coming from lakes or sea water and they are formed because of sedimentary processes. And under this, there are also examples such as evaporite deposit and then iron formation. Let's talk about evaporite deposits first. When we say evaporite deposits, they are the type of deposit that are typically occur in a close marine environment where evaporation is greater than water in flow. And because of that, most of the water evaporates the dissolved substances become more concentrated in the residual water and would eventually precipitate. Precipitate meaning from the solution it will tend to be in its solid structure. Some examples are the following. We have halite, halite or your NaCl, the salt that we are using, gypsum as well, borax and sylvite. Another example under sedimentary ore deposit includes the iron formation deposits. So meaning these are minerals that are made of iron. And these deposits are made of repetitive thin layers of iron-rich chert and several iron-bearing minerals. Such as we have hematite and magnetite. And if you notice the structure of the layers in it, the iron formations appear to be of evaporite type deposits and are mostly formed in basins within continental crust because we, as we know, iron is uh, an example of a heavy metal and they usually tend to uh, be cemented or deposited in the lower part of the basin or the crust. The fourth origin of minerals is under placer ore deposits. These deposits are formed by the concentration of valuable substances through gravity separation during sedimentary processes. And since it talks about the separation, the concentration would be according to the specific gravity of substances, wherein the heavy minerals are mechanically concentrated by water currents and the less dense particles remain suspended and are carried further downstream. Usually, this involves heavy metals that are resistant to transportation and weathering, and some of them are the following gold, platinum, and diamonds. So, usually they are deposited on the lower part of the basin also. Lastly, we have residual ore deposits. These are the type of deposit that results from accumulation of valuable materials through chemical weathering processes. Also, in this process, the rocks and enclosed mineral deposits undergo disintegration and decomposition through weathering. And in this case, the soluble parts are removed and the insoluble residues now will accumulate and they form the residual mineral deposit. One example here is bioxide. Well, bioxide is derived when aluminum-rich source rock undergo intense chemical weathering that is brought by prolonged rains maybe and it will leach the common elements that include silicon, sodium, and calcium 
and whatever mineral insoluble mineral left that is now called as the biotite. Another is the nickeliferous laterites, or also known as the uh, uh, nickel laterites. Originally, these are called as the olivine rich ultramafic rocks such as dunite and peridotite. However, because of weathering and leaching, the rocks dissolve common elements and uh, the materials only that are left in that original rock includes nickel, magnesium, and iron oxide and they're mixed with soil and now they form the nickeliferous laterites. Now we're done talking about the types and the origin of mineral resources. Now let's move on to mineral exploration. Mineral exploration, it means to say we are to extract and we are to mine minerals. But why? It's because we use them in our everyday living. That's the reason that we extract them, we process them, is for our everyday consumption. And in mineral exploration, there are major stages that are involved. First of which is the project design. This is the initial stage in formulating a project. What will we do here? This will be uh, the involvement of review of all the available data, also the government requirements in acquiring the project, review of social, environmental, political, and economic acceptability of the project, and also about budgeting and organization proposals of the plan. After now your project design, the second process is field exploration. Literally, you will go and explore the field. And this stage has three phases. First is the regional recognizance. In this case, the main objective is to identify targets or interesting mineralized zones covering a relatively large area. So it might be regional. After identifying large area, you can now proceed to detailed exploration. This involves now more detailed surface and subsurface activities with the objective of finding and delineating targets or mineralized zones. And after that, you can now have your prospect evaluation. So this will now assess market profitability by first extensive resource, geotechnical, and engineering drilling for you to test whatever samples you have there. Number two, you also have the metallurgic testing. You will test now the samples you got, whether we have gold, silver, or tin. And lastly, environment and in societal cost assessment. This is very important for you to test whether you will profit or you will lose in that project design. Finally, you can now go to the last stage, which is the pre-production feasibility study. What is this all about? The feasibility study determines and validates the accuracy of all data and information collected from the different stages. This is very important. Why? You need to satisfy interested investors to raise funds and bring the project into production. In business, the more investors you have, the more profit you have. Moving on, let's talk about the mining methods. There are two main methods of mining. First is the surface mining, wherein this includes the extraction of ore minerals that are close to the Earth's surface. The second one is the underground mining that includes also the extraction of ore minerals from the ore body that is deep under the Earth's surface. After mining, the extracted rocks will undergo processes of mineral separation and recovery. That is now called as the milling process. But why? Well, the materials extracted or mined are rocks composed of both ore and waste material. And the one you want to get now are the ore products. With this, this involves the processes. Crushing the, the materials, screening them, and grinding or pulverizing. 
After that, you are now ready to recover the materials or minerals included in the mined substances. Alright, let's say for example you already have the grinded and then the pulverized materials from the one you extracted. Now, the waste and the minerals are not yet separated. That's why we need to have the recovery methods. For the recovery methods, we have several ways on how to separate waste from the mineral. First is the heavy media separation. For this process, the crushed rocks are submerged in liquid where the heavier and denser minerals sink. Thus, they are separated from the lighter minerals. Take a look at the illustration we have here. All the lighter minerals will float here on top and all the heavier or the denser minerals or materials will sink. And take note, if we are dealing about metals, they are heavier when it comes to their density. Another method in how we separate uh, minerals from the waste product is through magnetic separation. So in this case, if the metal or mineral is magnetic, the crushed ore is separated from the waste materials using a powerful magnet. So here in the illustration that we have, we have now here the round moving belt along the wheel of or with magnetic property. And with this case, when you drop all the crushed materials here, it will separate the magnetic substances from the non-magnetic substances. Another way on how to separate waste from mineral is through flotation. So in this case, the powdered ore is placed into an agitated and fruity slurry basin wherein some minerals and metals based on physical and chemical properties may either sink to the bottom or may stick to the bubbles on top. Just like what you can see here, we have bubbles and then they will rise to the top thus separating the minerals and metals from the waste. So here on the bottom part are already uh, containing the mineral part while the waste products are here on top. Another method is the cyanide heap leaching. So this now involves the uh, usage of some chemicals in order to separate the uh, mineral from the waste product. Right, this method is used for low-grade gold ore where the crushed rock is placed on a leach pile where cyanide solution is sprayed or dripped on top of the pile. So if you will see the illustration that we have here, this one is uh, the uh, pile wherein they are to put all the uh, crushed materials. And uh, with that, they will put cyanide so that it will now dissolve whatever mineral is in here and most of the time for this is used for gold extraction of gold and then as the leach solution percolates down through the rocks the gold is dissolved into the solution and after that it will now go to this part the solution is processed further to extract the gold and that is how we separate minerals using cyanide hip leach. Now we're done talking about the mining methods, we're also done talking about the mining process and then the recovery methods. And now it's time for us to talk about the environmental impacts. I'm not against mining because we also need to perform such activity in order for us to sustain our needs. However, miners must be mindful because irresponsible mining can lead to the following negative impacts. First, flooding. As you can see in the picture, it involves a wide range of the society or the community. Erosion as well. 
irresponsible mining can lead to erosion. There, subsidence as well as you can see, because of irresponsible mining, water pollution, and also it can lead to air pollution, and as well as lastly we have damage to wildlife and habitat. It's very sad to see how people really enjoy extracting and getting all the natural resources that we have however they are insensitive with all the negative impacts of it. So as a miner and as a user of the minerals, we must conserve and we must know how to use them properly. Now. Here are some of the mitigation processes of the harmful effects of irresponsible mining. First is the topsoil replacement using uncontaminated soil. As you notice in the picture, they are trying to replace soil on the surface of this, this plateau or this place. And also, we have the reintroduction of flora and fauna. This is very important, especially to the damaged wildlife, in order to sustain the balance in our community or environment, what is called as the ecological balance. And also, another ways also on how to mitigate the harmful effects of irresponsible mining is to neutralize acidic waters maybe this one is uh, by adding neutralizers to the water whatever the dnr may suggest you as well as backfilling and sealing of abundant underground mine this is very important in order for us to avoid erosion and landslide and lastly stabilizing the slopes of impacted area to reduce erosion also and landslide these are the sum of the common mitigation processes but as a citizen, and uh, I know we can do more than the following. We've been talking about the negative impacts of irresponsible mining, as well as the mitigation processes in order for us to lessen the negative impacts of it. Our government also, they have rules in... Uh, maintaining or addressing those concerns and some of the agencies or departments are the following we have the mines and geosciences bureau or the mgb this department is responsible and uh, we have responsible for the conservation management and development and proper use of the country's mineral resources including those in reservations and lands of public domain and also we have the Environmental Management Bureau or the EMB. They're also responsible for planning, also for the programs, and then the appropriate environmental quality standards for the prevention and control of pollution. And also lastly, we have Philippine Mine Society and Environmental Association or the PMC. And they are also responsible in the promotion of occupational health and safety sound environmental management and social responsibility in the country's mineral industry so they are very important in order to help us to uh, plan well in order for us to be knowledgeable they give us seminars they give us information on how to be a responsible citizen this for example you're a miner in order for you to uh, do a particular task in proper order And that ends our discussion. Thank you so much for listening. And you are now ready to answer your exercises. Have a great day, everyone.